Welcome to Senior Living Marketing Perspectives. I'm Debbie Howard, co-founder of Senior Living Smart. And today I'm speaking with Mike Miller, president and CEO of Primo Solutions and the author of Stop Selling and Start Caring. So welcome, Mike. Thanks, Deb. It's great to be here. It's great to see you, although we usually see each other this time of year at industry conferences. Uh, obviously, that's been put on hold. And just to put this into context for the listeners, um, we are recording this at the end of April of 2020, which um, is right kind of in the middle of uh, a new reality that we're all um, experiencing together of COVID-19. And when I thought about the podcast and uh, the guests, my, my dream guests that I wanted to have on it, uh, Mike was at the top of the list. Um, and I thought back to his book, Stop Selling and Start Caring. And I thought how relevant that is today because a, a lot of what our traditional salesy sales methods, uh, you know, we fall, we typically fall back on, are uh, really not available to us. Um, and so, you know, maybe this is the time, Mike, when salespeople can't sell in that traditional way, uh, that maybe they can learn something new uh, and start with more empathy and more caring. So maybe take us back to, you know, when and, and why you, you wrote the book and a little bit about, about your background. Yeah, thanks. That was a great question. And I'd love to introduce the book, but to, to properly introduce the book, for those who um, have read some of my books, they know that, the, that I have other books I've written. And I actually wrote my first sales book, which was Selling at Combat Speed. And um, a lot of people kind of frown upon that. They're like, hey, we're not in combat, but it really has nothing to do with combat. As, as a combat veteran being in the military, um, whenever we train certain tasks, we just trained over and over and over and over and over until it became part of our muscle memory. Kind of like athletes, you know, professional athletes, they don't have to think about the task or what they're doing. They just get up and they kind of just do their thing because it's part of their muscle memory. We do the same thing in the military. So when you are in a combat situation, you don't have to stop and think about it. You just kind of react. And my thought was, how can I take those fundamentals and transfer those also into corporate America. So we're training our people in a way that the sales process is something that comes to them just automatically. It's a process they're using and it kind of flows. They adapt and overcome. And, and it worked well for several years. I actually spoke about this and trained in a number of different um, verticals. But as most people know that know me, um, we've dedicated you know, the past 15 years to the senior living industry. So people start asking, hey, Mike, when are you going to write a book about sales just for our industry. And finally, um, in 2011, I wrote Stop Selling and Start Caring. An interesting thing about the books that I write is normally I'll write the book and then I'll come up with the title. And as I was right in the middle of writing Stop Selling and Start Caring, I had a colleague call me and um, it, it, was, it was another vendor that thought, hey, there's might be some just synergies between our companies. And as we started talking, I found out that he had just moved his mother into a senior living community. And he said, Mike, he goes, I called, you know, eight, nine, 10 different places. I went to visit two or three different communities. Um, he goes, and you know, the one thing that, that was consistent, that was really hard is that nobody ever asked me how I was doing as the adult child. Right. And, and and it and it felt like because I like because I know that these people care, but I felt like they really didn't care. That all they cared about was, you know, my mom and you know what she qualified for and what her needs were. Not one single person had asked him how I was handling, how I was challenging it. He said, Mike, if you can do me a favor, I know you speak all the time, you go to conferences, you sh you're training, you're coaching. Every time you talk, you let people know that even though they do care, that they need to kind of change their approach and quit coming across so salesy, but let us know that they really do care about not just the prospect, but all of us. And that's how the birth of the title came in. It's like, let's let's take the, the salesy part out of it the, that, that you hear about so much, it gives us such a bad name for sales. And let's really care about the prospect. Let's care about the family members, what they're going through in that period of time, and really focus on the needs and, and their solutions and and not take it from a sales perspective. I tell people all the time, the sale will take care of itself if we really just genuinely care about the prospect. So that's how the whole um, birth of Stop Selling, Start Caring came along. 
Yeah, I really love that. Um, you know, I used to sell at the community level many years ago and, uh, you know, it was always so disarming just to ha make a human statement at the beginning of the call to say, how are you doing today? Because I'm guessing this is the most difficult call you're going to make today. And people like they might have called those eight or nine other communities and the other communities were like name, address, phone, zip. How'd you hear about us? What medications are your mom on? And then they started using words like ADL and assistive device. And like, you know, we get into that. Um, and I don't know why you think that happens. You know, is it that we've been combat trained? <laughs> is it that we're led by our inquiry sheet? And if we miss a question, we're going to get in trouble. Is it that we allow our CRM to control the sales interaction because we know we have to fill in those fields in order to enter it into the CRM? Um, or is it because we're just not comfortable, you know, being more emotional? What do you think? Yeah, you know, great question. I love I love what you started off with, Debbie. It's like, this is probably the most difficult call you're gonna have to make today. And, and maybe not even today, maybe in, in, in the whole month or, or the whole year. Um, but I think it's a combination of things that um it, yeah anybody that knows me that's heard me speak and i've publicly spoken about it yeah i'm not a huge fan of, of inquiry sheets um especially for um seasoned sales counselors um i do think that we get tied down to it we treat it more like an interview process we kind of check the block and like yeah i've asked this question that's this question we don't go any deeper and yeah some of those inquiry sheets and those questions are built into the crm and yeah, then we still sound very robotic, so interview. Um, but part of that is also a training issue. Um, I, I think sales people need to go back to the basics and, and really learn the process of sales training. And that falls on the leadership. The leadership has got to get involved. It can't be just in you know, the sales counselors. EDs need to get involved. Regionals need to get involved. Executives need to get involved and really create a sales culture um, define what that culture looks like, uh, what that process looks like, and then hold people accountable for it. And I know the accountable word is a word that some people are like, oh my gosh, it's like big brother, big sister looking at me. Um, but we all need to be held accountable for certain things. And um, when it comes to our sales process, most of us, even though we have sales trainers um, and we say that we have a sales process, most of us don't have a process. Most companies don't even have a sales culture. And that's where I was asked, and encourage leaders to really focus look at that uh inquiry now don't tell, get me wrong inquiry sheets i think are good for um for folks that are coming into the industry that don't really understand the industry um maybe very new at selling and don't even know where to even start asking the questions but to me that's kind of just a starter sheet if you're going to use an inquiry sheet i like to have mm -hmm. like cheater questions you know maybe a list of few questions that i can ask i love that the question you just said like this is this is probably one of the most difficult phone calls you'll make today is a great way that you could really start almost any call and really get that person on the other end of the phone call to really open up. So, yeah, it's a combination of, of a variety of different things. So, you know, you talk about sales culture and I agree that. Uh, it's not very well defined um, or we say we have it, but we do a training the first couple of weeks that somebody's you know comes on board or maybe a once a year kind of group training but it's it's like an like professional athlete to your point uh they're always training right so you know roger federer and all these other great athletes they still have their trainer and their nutritionist and their team and they still work out and they, you know he knows how to hit tennis balls right yeah. um and yet he's never really you know done training or practicing or the golfers that spend all the time you know on the uh you know on the practice range and things like that. So what, what do you recommend? You're a sales trainer and coach and people hire you to come into their organizations to help them either create or reinforce um, their philosophy. First of all, do you think that there's a, a lot of different philosophies out there? Or do you think we as an industry, you know, fall into a, a couple of, of, of key camps? Um, and then the second part of the question is, what are the steps that leaders should take to really help them define their philosophy that will then inform their their sales training process. Yeah, I I think there are a lot of um, trainers out there that have their sales process, if you will, that that, that they train on. 
Um, but if, if you really look at it, there's I think the, the majority of the training does kind of boil down to the same basic ideas. Um, and, and it's more about um, the, the flavor that the sales trainer puts on um, their training and um, the, the personality of the trainer. You know, that, that's things when I talk to to my clients, um, you know, I, I want to talk to them, I want them to to see my personality. Even when I'm speaking, I mean, there's not an event planner out there that that's worth their weight in gold that will hire you if you don't have some type of speaker demo video. They want to see how you perform on on stage. And same thing for training. It's like you need to be able um, to 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 really meld with the the group that you're with. Um, have a personality um, that that goes with that group. Um, and and quite frankly, really know, really believe in in what you're training. And it's and the thing about the training, especially is if the industry changes, that your, our training should be fluid as well. Our, our training shouldn't be, my training shouldn't be the same thing, you know, 10 years ago that, that it is today. It, it should grow and it should change as the industry changes. So, um, yeah, there, there's a lot of different ways to, to, to look at, at training. I honestly believe that most companies look at it from, uh, from a budget perspective. Like who's, who can I get for the, the least amount of money? And as we all know, you get what you pay for. Um, but that's saying all that as far as leadership, um, I, I, I do believe that it, it's a leadership issue. I think um, I think great leaders will, will, will delegate, will also get their team involved with the decision making process. I believe when you um, you need to have your team uh, work with you to develop the culture. In your company, and I, I, and don't get me wrong, there's there's a lot of companies, a lot of great companies out there that have great strategies, um, but uh, I think it's Peter Drucker that said, you know, strategy eat, or culture eats strategy for breakfast every day. We can have a great strategy, but if you don't have the culture in place and the buy-in where people really believe in in the process and what they're doing, then it's not going to work. And on top of that, when you do hire a trainer, it can't just stop at that one or two days of training. Um, it's got to be consistent follow up, consistent follow through, because we forget about 80 percent of what we hear within about 48 hours. And that's where I see where a lot of companies are dropping the ball, where they may bring in a couple of speakers, a couple of trainers, maybe even a couple of times a year, every other year. Uh, but there's no follow up uh, to that actual training to reinforce those skills. So today is really an interesting time for our industry and really for the world. But honestly, it's kind of the best time to practice empathetic selling, right? So we've got, we're hearing that lead, new lead volume is down um, 30 to 50%, um, depending on who, you know, who's giving you that information. But lead volume is definitely dropping off. Sales teams are not so distracted because they're not doing events and they're not going to networking and they're probably not doing um, out, you know, sales calls. And so they kind of have this this little gift of time where they have fewer leads to work. Um, talked to Julie Podowitz uh, earlier about lead volumes down, but conversions are up. They're convert. They are doing better with advancing, better with closing, and they're still closing <laughs> um, without the lead volume. So how do how how would you recommend that people kind of use this time where they they have um, Fewer incoming calls, um, fewer incoming leads, so they they have fewer that they're working, but they also have this database, right? This treasure trove of leads that are bought and paid for that they always tell us that they don't have time to work. So how would you, as a sales coach, really recommend that people begin maybe practicing empathetic sales because they can't sell the tour, the lunch, the event. So how would they kind of make that shift to connect differently? Yeah, that's that's a great point that you bring up, and and uh, I, I know Julie very well, and and it's nice to nice to hear, and, and she's not the first person that that I've heard say that hey, we're we're actually we are still closing, um, our conversion rates are are even higher with less with less leads, um, it's, it's something that that I've thought has been um, maybe a weakness, if you will, something that that we can improve on in the industry. I think we spend way too much money on incoming leads. Uh, you've heard me say this. Um, a lot of uh, well-known trainers out there, my very good friend David Smith from Sherpa has said this. Um, and yep. I firmly believe that for the most part, for established communities, we probably already have enough leads in our database to fill our communities. 
The problem is, is that we have so many new leads coming in that we don't have time to actually work and nurture those leads that we have in the CRM. So we forget about them or we call them up like two or three times. And if we don't hear from them, we drop them off in that cold bucket and maybe invite them to a community event or something like that. Now we're in an unprecedented time where, you know, we have to pretty much kind of sell over the phone. A lot of companies out there are starting to move to more virtual tours, um, but we have to make a difference on the phone. Um, we're not getting a whole lot of new leads come in like we normally do. And um, we have to go back and actually start, we're forced to work the CRM leads, which I've been saying for over a decade, work the leads in your system. That's the low hanging fruit. Julie, as you said, Julie said, hey, we don't have as many leads, but our conversion rates are, are still going up. Um, so that's that's something that I would say is, is just critical. Um, I've challenged companies and communities across the industry, across the country to, hey, Stop investing so much money in marketing, you know, and focus more on investing in your staff and training your staff and teach them how to actually work their CM, work their leads. Nobody listens to that. And what happens is now you turn into a numbers game. And my opinion, I call them a micism, is that we pay a lot of money to, to sales counselors to do their jobs. But if we're going to turn into a numbers game, if you give anybody you can bring somebody off the street that's never worked in senior living and if you give them enough leads they'll get enough tours that will turn into enough into move-ins but you're going to spend thousands and tens of thousands of dollars to do that you hire the people to do the job to do a good job and you're hiring quality people let them do their job yeah that's a great point i remember calculating when i was a vp of sales and marketing at five star that, and this was, you know, probably eight, nine years ago now, that to get a qualified lead, to make my phone ring, it costs $500. Yes. Yeah. That, and, and, and that's that's the number. It's been, it kind of fluctuates over the years. Yeah. Here at conferences, it, I've heard like four to $800 for that qualified lead. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sure it's more now. Um, but, you know, because that was many years ago and it was $900 for a tour, which yeah. is probably closer to $1,200 now. Um, so if you take a look at your database and how many leads you have in the year, you know, you have 200 leads at $500 a piece. That's a big investment that's sitting there. And I know some of the things that drives me crazy, and I'm sure you as well, is, you know, I'll look even at our clients databases today and um, I look at the lost leads. And I find that the number one reason that they're moving them to lost is unable to reach which is not lost. Yes. <laughs> and then and yeah. then I look at the 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 total number of attempts to reach them before they move them not just to cold to lost. And and once it's lost yeah. it's over. I mean it's yeah. over. It you're dead, it's gone. I'm never going to call you. You're not going to get a newsletter. You're not going to get invited to events. Um is two. So they make two attempts. Move them yeah. not to cold but to lost unable to reach. So I do think that there's a lot of opportunity and in terms of how to how to kind of use this time, I think there's never been a better time because people are actually available. All those people that you were unable to reach who are usually at work and they're crazy busy and they're the sandwich generation and now everyone's sheltering in place and at home, you know, uh, you probably have a much better chance uh, of reaching them today. And they're probably less threatened because what are you going to do? <laughs> you, know, you you can't really sell them, right? So, but you can empathetically to your, you know, start caring. The start caring is just, how are you doing? I just thought I would call and see how your day is going. And do you have everything that you need? And can I be of any help? And, you know, do you have family support? And are you getting uh, groceries? And, uh, you know, I think this is the perfect time to kind of practice those skills. So do you have any recommendations around making that switch or maybe as the clients that you're working with, like Angela, like how she's training her teams uh, to engage a little bit differently? Yeah, you know, and and, and you nailed it, Deborah. The, the, the idea, right, the approach that we need to take, and we're an impre unprecedented, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, unprecedented. unprecedented times. <laughs> um, and you know 
you're right. We we can't sell, if you will. I'm not putting sell because we really need to care, but we can't sell the way that we typically do. I mean, normally the 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 close for a phone call is give people come for tours. Oh, well, we can't do tours, but um, I think I think you're right. I think right now is is the time to to, to take the focus off of the selling piece um, and really think about what can I do to um, further connect, to further nurture that, that relationship, build that relationship. And, and to further even build trust um, with, with the prospects that we have uh, that, that are uh, that, that are in our CRM. And I had a few lists, and you actually named a few on my list, and you named off several that I have on there. But <coughs> excuse me, uh, you know, I I don't think we've talked about these yet. But conducting virtual tours, I know a lot of companies out there are are starting to move to more virtual tours. Matter of fact, we uh, we've had some clients reach out to us. Um, and to conduct mystery shopping on their sales counselor using you know the virtual tour and however they they want to use that it's it's um, there's enough tools out there now um, that are industry specific there's you know there's stuff on on uh, FaceTime Skype however you want to do it um, but now you can conduct you know at least virtual tours um, and we need to think about that because you know we're seeing in press conferences that. The, they're calling them nursing homes. Well, we'll say nursing homes, senior living is going to be the most um, watched uh, part of the industry and maybe the last one to really get back to normal um, is mm -hmm. what they're saying. So um, we, have to, we have to think about the way that we're selling now and they don't know what's going to happen in the winter if this is going to surge again and if this happens and we have to close things down so why not start putting these things start practicing these things start mastering these it's, it's that selling at combat speed that whole training where you're learning to do something a little bit you're having to adapt and overcome and really work on those relationships um, a big part of all of this that we're talking about with the crm is create a follow-up and i don't like to just use follow-up um, to me, following up and leaving a voicemail is not follow up. Um, when I talk about follow up, I'm talking about creative follow up. And this is a great opportunity to to do some creative follow up, um, to, to nurture that relationship. And you you nailed it. Uh, what, what if you drop off some items that you know that the, your prospects uh, need and care packages, right? It's like hand sanitizers, mm -hmm. uh, jigsaw puzzles or, or the puzzle books. Um, toilet paper, right? Who would have thought that we'd have, ever have a shortage on, on toilet paper? Um, but if you if imagine just putting a roll of toilet paper in that in that bag and being able to just go and just drop that up, doing what, uh, you know, we're used to calling home visits. Oh, we can't really do home visits, go inside people's homes, but you can do a porch visit, right? We just sure. did that over Easter with our family. Went to our in-laws, we stood out in the driveway, we looked kind of funny because everybody was safe distancing, but we did our porch visit with, with our family. So you can do a porch visit with your prospects and drop this off, or you can call them and say, hey, I'm dropping off a little gift basket for you and be right outside your um, on, on your porch. Um, delivering meals, right? And these can be meals that are cooked in our communities. Um, we can actually you know, call uh, restaurants and go pick them up, go have them delivered. Um, you know, and, and same thing, you know, they're, they're kind of like leaving them on their porch, let them know that they're coming. So there's no, you know, interaction uh, going on between those individuals. Um, here's an interesting concept that we've talked about for years that I think that hardly nobody does anymore because we don't have time. But what about handwritten notes? When's the last time you did a handwritten note or even received a handwritten note? You're right, right. Debbie. Now we have the time. Let's send some handwritten notes and 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 take that a step further. Personalize it about the last time that you corresponded with them or the last time that you met with them and talk about something specific that you spoke about or something that may have happened. Because I'm not the only one telling people to write handwritten notes. People, there's other communities out there, other companies that are doing it. So just like anything else in your sales process, what are you doing to set yourself apart? Don't just send a note, hey, I'm checking in on you, let us know if you need anything, but make it, add that to it, but make it really personal. And then, um, yeah, ask if it's okay, if you actually get a hold of them, you probably will. Ask if it's okay if you continue to check in on them. It's okay to to, to let them know that that you care and you're concerned. And, and if you do have to leave a voicemail, um, some people do screen their calls. Um, if you're calling uh, mobile phones, I know I have filters on my mobile phone. 
If, if, if you're not listed as a contact, it goes straight to a, a voicemail. So if you do have to leave a voicemail, keep it short, uh, keep it simple. And something along the lines, um, you know, I was just thinking about you. I was concerned about you with everything that's going on and wanted to make sure that you had everything that you need. Just if yeah. these all to me seem like common sense items, but things that we've forgotten to do and that we no longer do because we don't have the time. And like you said, Deb, we now have that time to do it. Yeah, it is. It's a perfect time to practice some of these new skill sets. And, uh, you know, it's kind of subtle because when you drop things off at their porch, whether it's meals from the kitchen or supplies that they can't get a hold of, you're really sending the message that says, we have these. Mm -hmm. We don't experience these same shortage. We're happy to share with you, but it's kind of a, a subtle way of saying, you know, if, if I was in a community, I'd have access to meals and medication and care and um, engagement. And then I think the other part that you bring up, which is so important, is uh, the personalization. You know, my mom is 87. She's alone. She's in Connecticut. We're all distancing. And if somebody dropped off, she's a master gardener, you know, she's sewing masks for for yep. the hospital. She's like a little sweatshop over there, like producing <laughs> masks. <laughs> you know, she's got her whole church doing masks. And, uh, you know, she loves nothing, nothing more than Earl, a cup of Earl Grey tea. You drop off something at her house that's got like crossword puzzle, a crossword puzzle, a thing of tea, uh, you know, and a gardening book or something. I mean, yep. she will follow you home. Because it says, it says, I know you. Yeah. It, you know, it's, it's one thing to say, I'm thinking about you or I'm caring about you. But I think it's very different to say, I see you. Because yes. one of the things my mom says is the hardest thing about being 87 is that she's invisible and um, culturally irrelevant. And that's sad. You know, right. And yeah. if you think about it, and I, I heard a stat uh, a couple of days ago on, on the news. and I don't know which company out there did the survey, but some they did a survey or poll. Uh, but they found in this poll, they found that 40% of all Americans have reporting have reported feeling lonely, a sense of loneliness. And you know that, that, that's just that's just not seniors. That that that's all of us that are stuck in our homes. And yeah, some of us are lucky enough to have somebody there living in our homes to take to be able to talk to. Um, but I think for the first time ever. We're kind of getting a small taste of what our seniors, a lot of our seniors go through on a daily basis um, yep. you know, that are living at home. Um, even the some that, that live with their adult children, you know, that, that have jobs and have other things that they have to do. You know, they still feel lonely and they don't, like you said, they don't, they're not seen. They don't really have, um, they don't feel valued. They don't feel like there's anything that, um, that they can give back to, to the world. Um, there's so much of that loneliness that that's going on, and to do these small little things, um, you know, one something just came to my mind is, you know, we do have a lot more time as sales counselors, you know, to to let the the family members and prospects, whoever you're talking to, let them know that hey, if you just need to talk, give me a call, you know, I'm here right. just to talk, you know, not about anything yeah. in particular. But if you just feel lonely and need to talk to somebody, give me a call and I'd love to talk. Nothing screams I care more than that. I'm taking time out of my day just to have a conversation about whatever. Yeah, no, I love that. I think that's really true. I don't know. One of the things we budgeted for our clients was a um, was a subscription to a company called Love Pop. I don't know if you've ever seen Love Pop cards, or those three-dimensional cards. Yes. And they're like... They're so amazing and they have this catalog. Doesn't matter if you're a cat lover, dog lover, whatever your hobby, gardening, if you have Mother's Day or Father's Day or whatever it is, they have a card for it. And it's very experiential, right? And, and yeah. you know, those things might have gotten overlooked before, but now the highlight of my day is going to the mailbox. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> I'm going to get that mail. I'm going to get out of that house for 10 minutes or five minutes, and I'm going to be opening it for the first time ever. Uh, <laughs> so I think that those personal touches are so important. 
So let's talk about the other part of your business. So you're an author and, a, and a, I know I've seen you present um, and speak, which is so fun. Um, but then you also have a, a mystery shopping company, whether it's uh, phone shops or in-person shops or even for people to um, kind of assess the customer experience on the website, right? right. You can go in and <clears throat> you become the consumer and um, I've used your services and th it's very realistic. Um, uh, you know, so often my sales teams would say, I knew it was a mystery shop. <laughs> <You know? laughs> when I listen to yours, I don't know that they're mystery shops. So um, I guess in, in some regards, um, this might be an ideal time to to do that because we don't sometimes have the time to stop and assess how our sales teams are doing so we even know how to construct the, the ongoing sales trainings, um, what we need to reinforce. And that's what, that's what mystery shopping is all about, right? It's not an I gotcha. It's about a real assessment of strengths and weaknesses and opportunities so that we can help our teams improve. Um, so you've done over 150,000 mystery shops. When when you look back at that, what are some of the major kind of pitfalls that we just can't we can't seem to get out of our own way um, that you see as the trends? Maybe both on the probably more on the negative side because unfortunately every time I listen to mystery shops, I it's just so horrifying. I have a hard time getting through them. Uh, but then you know, are there are there some uh, some things that you're seeing uh, that might give us hope? <laughs> Yeah, you know, thanks Dave, for bringing up that service and and uh, this definitely isn't a, a sales platform um, by any stretch. But yeah, we, we we have conducted a lot of mystery shops. Um, we do work, you know, pretty exclusively in the senior living space, um, and that's something we actually do take a lot of pride in. Um, and um, yeah, we and and as we've gone through and we and we've conducted um, so many, you know, like I said, over over 150,000, and that's probably just phone shops. Um, we, we, you know, the, the web shops are great because, um, you know, normally a, a basic client would do like web phone and in-person and in-person could be unrecorded. It could be recorded if, if mm -hmm. you want audio recorded and some even video recorded. Um, but, um, the, the web shops are nice just because, um, you get that speed to lead, you know, you get to find right. out, you know, how quickly, um, our sales counselors really responding to the lead. Now, I'm not talking about these auto-generated emails because um, I personally just I, I I feel about those like I feel about inquiry sheets. Um, there's nothing personalized about them. Um, when we and as a matter of fact, we don't even count that as um, as uh, when we're doing our speed to lead our web shops um, as a contact. We our contact is hey when does somebody actually send a personalized uh, email back to us? Um, but yeah, we we have learned uh, a, a whole lot, um, and 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 one thing uh, that that we've done, and, and you talk about lost leads a few minutes ago. Uh, what what we've learned in doing lost leads and through mystery shops and all that is is that we we typically, as an industry, will lose seventy to eighty percent of our deals over the phone, and we just threw out that number, you know, four, five, six hundred dollars per lead. You know, and, and my thought when I started hearing those numbers, I thought to myself years ago, like we pay commissions and we, you know, pay bonuses based on, you know, your occupancy or what your closing ratios are. Like, what if we deducted from your paycheck when you lost those leads, right? <laughs> and, you know, and, and you sell people. I, I brought now you're that scaring up. people, Mike. <laughs> yeah. I brought that up at a conference and I thought people were going to throw tomatoes at me, right? But you know, like, obviously that's, that's not ideal. We, we'd never do that. But what if we actually just started thinking like that? Because yeah, and, and here's why we lose so many. We'll call, a prospect will call eight to 10 communities, but they're only going to go visit two to three. So when they get off that phone, even when they're on the phone, when they get off that phone, they've got this list of 10 communities and their goal is to mark communities off their list because they got to get that 10 down to about two or three. There, nobody's going to go visit 10 communities. They want to visit two to three communities. So when they get off that phone, they're looking for a reason to mark you off the list, not for a reason to actually come and visit your community. So yeah, you've got to do something different, you know, and that on the web, the web is important, much more important than it was 10 years ago. If those leads are coming in organically through the web and through these paid leads, you have to be, you have to show some, build some type of rapport, if you will, um through through your web 
and and even with your phone calls um you know i hear you know when when the whole uh business of recording all phone calls coming in came in you know uh, um people's like are you going to lose business and you know to me i thought no i'm, I'm not going to lose business and, and the difference i think those are great As a matter of fact that's a service that we provide we provide that same service you can record and track your marketing and see where these dollars are going so, but what you don't get out of that is the customer experience what our shoppers will do by providing mystery shopping is you get that recorded call but they're also going to have this question customized questionnaire that the clients are going to come up with that's going to gauge the customer experience it's kind of like i like to use the analogy um, you know if you've ever gone to an interview a job interview and you walked out of there thinking man i just knocked it out of the park yet you never got a call back you know or you never got that second interview and you're wondering what happened like i thought i did such a great job our perception of when we listen to these calls and the prospect's perception is completely different and perception is reality so we do need to think about those um those th those deals that that we're actually losing and how we're handling calls now if i can geek out for a few minutes and just show absolutely that that yeah. kind of like just blow my mind and i think it blows other people's minds um whenever we share these stats with us um but this and this is just phone shops this is not the in-person shops but here's what we found um and i'll just i'll just throw out about four of them that 15% of the time, it took 10 or more calls to actually speak to a sales counselor. Now, wow. I think only 15% of the time, but that's 15 prospects out of 100. And if you think about 15 prospects, and um, just just say that, uh, you know, half of those maybe would be generous, say half of those would actually come in for a tour. So you got like seven of them, and one or two might actually convert into a move. Um, that's a lot of lost leads that you're losing just because your salespeople are not available to answer the phone. They need to be there. They need to answer their phones. Um, they need to return voicemails quickly. Um, another stat, 90% of questions that are asked by sales counselors are closed in questions. And a lot of these are off inquiry sheets. Um, a lot of them are because we're trying to qualify or trying to validate or, you know, what are their ADLs? You know, do they even qualify for even being in here financially or are they qualified? But it is impossible. We're talking about building rapport here maybe in a little bit, but it's impossible to build rapport if you're not asking open-ended questions. There's a place for closing questions, but I would say that 90% of your questions should be open-ended and maybe 10 should be closed. Um, mm -hmm. But it's the complete opposite right now. Um, we talk about the 80-20 rule. I like to give sales counselors the benefit of the doubt and say, hey, let's let's just shoot for the 70-30, where you're listening 70% of the time and you're talking 30% of the time. Well, 98% of sales counselors talked more than 70% of the time during the phone call. 98. So wow. there's about three percent of you out there that are actually doing <laughs> that. And that 2% that may only be talking 60 or 50%. But most, almost everybody is talking. And the reason why is because they're asking these closed in questions and they don't give the prospect the opportunity to actually open up and, and answer a question with more than one or, or two words. Um, and the, the, the last um, statistic I'll share, and I have a number of them, but 45% um, of the time the shopper was asked to visit the community in the first two minutes of the call and and i've heard wow. I've, I've heard leadership and you probably heard it you probably heard leadership like hey the goal is to get them coming for a tour get you know do that as quickly as possible but you know if you're sitting there and you're in two minutes and you're calling say hey i want some information about your community and you throw out something about yeah this is our community this is what we have and you should go visit our website and by the way we really can't give our community justice you really need to come in to visit to really get the true experience it, if you give me two minutes of your time and others are giving me eight, 10, 12, 15, 20 minutes of their time, immediately what's coming to my mind is you don't care enough. My, my time's not valuable enough for you to spend a few minutes to get to know about my situation and about what's going on in my life and where I need the help. Wow, those are really disturbing. <laughs> yes, that's the word I was gonna use, disturbing. So 
<laughs> so how so you give this information to the sales uh, leadership um, and then what is your recommendation for how to how to turn that around how to how to coach them well it's it's I like to say it's simple but it's not really it, it is it all falls back down to training you know and then that goes to my previous book, Selling at Combat Speed, things that, that I've learned in the military, uh, things that I've passed down to folks that work for me, um, you know, is that, you know, almost all of our challenges that we have in our companies with our staff can be fixed, and can be resolved with training and, and it's investment in your team members. But what's the first thing that gets cut when it's time for budgets? Is, is training, right. investment in our people. And I, I remember several years ago, um, a, a good friend of mine here in the Valley in Phoenix owns a furniture store, big, big furniture, uh, custom furniture store. And it was it was during the, the 2008 when the market was crashing, it was in the recession. And he called me up and goes, Mike, I want you to come do some training for my salespeople. And um, I'm like, um, okay, Ty. I said, yeah, I, I, I'd love to do that. I said, but I'm, I'm kind of surprised. I said, this is kind of falling off everybody's scope. He goes, yeah, I know. He goes, none of my competitors are doing training. He goes, so I thought, why should I do something that none of my competitors are doing? And yeah, he gets it. it it's about training. So, you know, whether you're listening to your live phone calls or you're doing your mystery shops, um, you have your surveys or whatever, wherever you're getting this information and you're seeing these opportunities, that's the area where you need to coach and you need to coach specifically to those sales counselors. Um, and and on the other flip side of that, you know, I, I mentioned a bunch of negative things about mystery shopping that, that, that we found. But I, we tell every one of our clients, that, you know, you're first of all, you're going to be shocked. You're going to be shocked when you hear these shops for the first time because I've heard it over and over, like, we just talked about this last week. How come they're not yeah. implementing and how come their scores are so low? And like, how come they're not doing what we're training? So yeah, you're going to be shocked. And and yeah, there's always going to be areas of opportunity. I said, but there's some positive things. There's always something positive that you can take out. I say always, there's been a handful of times when the shop has been so awful um, that I, I, I couldn't believe it. Um, but make sure that you do put um, a positive spin on what you're doing, you know, whether it's the mystery shops, identify where you need to coach and train, and also when you're training. Because, you know, at this point in time, we do ask our salespeople to wear multiple hats. And, and that's, that's another pet peeve of mine. I think we do a lot of non-revenue generating activities. That's another webinar. <laughs> so, but they are wearing multiple hats right now. Um, so, and it is more difficult to, to sell and, and increase those ratios. Um, but, to, to, but to be positive, encourage our people, build the morale, let them know they're appreciated. When somebody feels appreciated, they'll move heaven and earth to, to get the job done. Um, so, yeah, that, that, that's, that's a leadership thing that, that I think that we could never do too much of. Yeah, that's a good point. I think the other point is that, you know, 50 percent of our leads come in nights, weekends and holidays. And if we invest in our professional full time sales team, very few people invest in the front desk. Um, and also in the manager on duty program. So, you know, I, I find have found recently that a lot of uh, the leads aren't even getting past the front desk. The front desk person, for some reason, is saying things like we're full. Um, or um, somebody asked specifically about medication management. And it's like, no, we don't do that. We're independent living. Well, they were assisted living and they did medication management and they I mean, those calls aren't even getting to the sales team. So, you know, you also wonder about, you know, if if 70 to 80 percent of the sales are lost within that first conversation with the professional salesperson, what you were saying before, yeah. how many aren't even getting? How many are even getting there? And I don't know whether you've ever done mystery shopping on the weekend, but, you know, I unfortunately have myself personally and have been told that. When I asked to speak to somebody in the marketing department or to get information, I was like, oh, honey, no one is ever here on the weekend. I'm like, yeah. OK, no one is ever here. It's like nobody but us girls are ever here on the weekend. So <clears throat> I think we're sometimes not even measuring <clears throat> the real lost opportunities because um, they're kind of invisible. And that, that's a great point. And I, I would probably say half <clears throat> of our clients um, will have us do 
uh, phone shops on the weekends and at nights. So they alternate where one month we'll do business, next month we'll do nights, next month we'll do weekends. And 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 you're absolutely right. I mean, it, it's I'll use the word disturbing again. It's just disturbing and mm-hmm. how that call and how that lead is actually handled after hours and you know on on weekends. Um, and you know in in the training, whenever I'm doing any kind of training. Um, if at all possible, I always recommend the client invite the concierge, that front desk person, and the ED, especially the EDs as well, to come in. Um, the concierge normally, maybe even just the first half of the day, um, because that's kind of where we front load the phone and you know how to handle phone calls yeah. and, and those kind of leads. Um, but for the EDs to be there, ED, we you know as an industry we say our EDs are sales managers. Um, I, I don't go into too many communities where EDs act like sales managers and, and no fault really to them because they are wearing a ton of different hats. Um, but that's an accountability thing where leadership needs to, um, you know, hold our EDs accountable for being a sales manager. And if they're going to be the sales manager, they should be sit, they should know the sales process as well. As a matter of fact, who's the normally the backup to that sales counselor if a tour comes in? It's probably going to, you would hope it'd be the ED. Um, but you know that's another webinar for you, for your backup teams as well. But yeah, every I say everybody sells. Um, everybody needs to understand at least the very very basics, um, and it starts with that, that front desk concierge. Definitely. Well, it sounds like we have three more webinars and podcasts that we have to do together for all these topics. <laughs> <laughs> But I appreciate your insights and uh, today. And I just wanted, just as a last thing, I know you have some uh, special offers for uh, for the listeners, and just wanted to give you an opportunity also to talk about um, your digital comment card and then uh, how people can reach you. Yeah. So um, yeah, first of all, yeah, yeah, we we do have hard copies of Stop Selling, Start Caring, but uh, we are in a digital world. Um, and if, if anybody would like a, a, a free copy, a downloadable PDF of Stop Selling, Start Caring, uh, send me an email and um, I'll be happy to send you a, a, a free copy of that. Um, I guess this would be a good time to give you my contact information. It's Mike.Miller right. at PrimoSolutionsLLC.com, P-R-I-M-O Solutions, LLC.com. Um, the, the other things first, the digital comic cards. Um, these we have so many different digital comic cards. Uh, we you know, our most popular ones are you know post tour after tour you send out. Well, the digital comic card is more or less kind of like a survey. Um, it's branded, it's customized for uh, for each of our clients. Um, but we have them after the tour, you know, during like 30 days after a move in or uh, move out. If somebody's put in a request, you know, they're they're noticed that they're moving out. Uh, something that that we just uh, I just created a digital comic card recently, um, advertised on LinkedIn. Um, I, I called it um, um, the employee connection pulse. Um, but since we're all in this virtual world, um, and I know a lot of sales counselors are actually going into communities, um, but um, for those companies out there that have a lot of people working virtually, you know, you can send out this digital comic card to them and just find out, you know, how things are going with them. If they feel like they're being communicated enough, um, if they know about their health benefits, where to go for their health. You know, it's, it's a 10 or 12 question, takes less than five minutes to, to complete it. But it gives you a pulse on how your employees are doing in this virtual environment where they've never had to work. Some of us that work from home, we get it. We know how difficult it is to, to work from home, how disciplined you have to be. And now you've got some folks that are working at home, trying to do their job, trying to educate their children, trying to watch their children. They're wearing so many different hats at home. So this just kind of gives you an idea of, of what they're going through and maybe how you can actually help. Um, the things that you and I have talked about just a couple of days ago, Debbie, was the prospect connection pulse. Um, and that's, that's something that you can actually send out um, to your actual prospects and find out these kind of things that we talked about in this webinar. Like, you know, how, how are things going? What are some of the challenges? Do you have all the needs and resources that you need? Um, you know, do you have people that you can talk to? Um, do you have ways to get your medicine? How, however you want to customize that. And I know we're going to probably pilot this, this to maybe a couple of companies. Um, that's something that, that is also available 
um, to you to send out to your prospects as another touch point and as an opportunity to as a way to, to create that creative follow-up that, that we were talking about. Um, and then lastly, yes, we have clients that are, are, are reaching out to us. It's a smaller number that are doing virtual tours and, and asking us to do mystery shopping for, for virtual tours. Um, a lot of our clients kind of put things on hold and uh, sure. so, you know, we don't feel like it's fair you know, to, to really mystery shop them in this environment. In my mind, I want to say it's absolutely fair. You know, how do you know where you need to, they need to help? How do they know where they need to help um, in this kind of environment? Because it's new to yeah. them. Um, but yeah, and, and then the web piece, you know, that, that speed to lead. Now, I know we always have excuses. Of, hey, this is why we didn't reply and why it took so many hours blah, 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 to, to reply back. Now we have more time. We really should be testing to see not only how quickly they were responding to web, web um, inquiries, but what the quality of that message looks like, because we track that as well. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, we, we right now we're we're offering a special, and, and it's, yeah, it's short special. It, it's through the end of the month, um, and, and the reason why it's so short is because we do know that when the doors do open up to our senior living communities, all of our projects that have been put on hold are all going to just be slammed. Um, so right. we're not going to be able to have to give this opportunity such a low price, but we are offering a web and phone shop for $100 um, normally, and that, that's about $165 value. Um, so we, we've lowered awesome. our prices significantly, um, and it's and it's one of these things where you can probably you can call us up and you can order it, and then we'll bill you when we're done. Um, you don't have to sign any uh, any proposals or anything like that. Uh, one thing I will encourage that if you are planning on doing this, there are 12 states that require you to sign a tape consent form to record. So um, if you don't already have your folks that have signed that, um, I would get them to, to sign this tape consent so we can actually do the recorded phone shop. Um, we, we, we don't have to record it, but obviously that, that is the advantage to, to our shops is to record sure. it. Um, so those, those are a few things that, that, you know, like you, Debbie, we're, and you talk about your mom, we're all trying to figure out ways to give back. And, and, and we, I've been scratching my head for over a month now, sitting here in my house, like, what can I do? It's like our business put on hold. Um, <clears throat> we haven't closed our doors. We've kept everybody on salary uh, so that when they do open, we're, we're ready to go. But still being able to, to, what can we do to give back to our community? Yeah, we can go blood drives. Our church has that. But what can we do for our industry? And, and we felt like this is a good way for our, to give back to you, the people that, that we serve, but uh, that you allow us to partner with you. Um, and, and we don't ever want to take that for granted. It, it may seem like something small, um, but some things I talk about, the smallest things make the biggest differences. Um, so when you yeah. talk about selling, you're on the phone. Those little things do make big differences. Maybe something as small as this um, can make some type of impact in, in your uh, company. That's great. Well, certainly a good time to, to try out a good mystery shopping project if you haven't uh, already. So feel free to reach out to, uh, to Mike and his information will be in the show notes. And Mike, thank you so much for sharing your senior living marketing perspectives. It was, it was a pleasure. And for those that are watching this, uh, just just a plug. If you're uh, if you're not members of Senior Living Smart, you should be. You're doing yourself a disservice. Uh, Deb and Andrea and her team are phenomenal. Uh, and fantastic partners and and just just to give you a plug Deb and your team um we, you know we, we say that we have partners with 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 other vendors um you know there's probably a couple real good partners that are like two-way streets that we really do and i would have to say the senior living smarts our number one partner that you guys give to us more than we can possibly give back to you. And I know we've had these conversations, <laughs> but that's just the kind of, of people that we love to partner with and um, and the services that you provide. There's nobody else in the industry that's doing it. Um, and it's and it's such a great service. And, and to be able to partner with people uh, like you and your team um, is, is definitely our honor. So thank you for the time and the opportunity. Oh, thanks, Mike. That's my out to next conference. I'll have to hit you up with an adult cocktail. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. Appreciate your time. You. It's great seeing you, Deb. You too. Take care. Okay. You too. Bye-bye.